You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, queens. Hey. Hey, girls. So, <laughs> longtime listeners of the show know that we usually do a summer break. That's right. Burnout is real, even when it's something you love. I like know. Yeah, yeah, you need a break. We didn't want to leave you guys high and dry for all of this. Exactly. Over the summer, we're going to be featuring a few different things. Yeah, you might have heard a couple of our classic Patreon episodes. We'll put them on the feed. Yeah, that's right. And our Patreon episodes might be a little bit different like the formatting might be a little bit different but we think you're gonna love them right you you might have also heard an episode from another podcast that we might yeah. recommend we have a couple of shows we're gonna feature on the feed that we think you'll love while we take a little break we hope you enjoy the show and let's raise a glass and as always y'all we curse a little bit <laughs> So if you don't like strong language in your history, this may not be the show for you. No, Nathan's got a potty mouth, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, bitches! <laughs> Hello, my beautiful queens, and welcome back to another edition of Katie's Corner. I am so happy to have you guys back. The last few weeks, I have been balls deep in Tudor history because we have been researching Anne of Cleves as I'm sure you know this episode has the series has been our best download rates we've ever had I would have thought that that would have been reserved for Catherine of Aragon or Anne Boleyn but no you guys I feel like everyone's like no we've heard those stories they wanted to hear about Anne of Cleves and um love that journey for Anne because I feel like she gets overlooked so so often also when I started writing this episode I wanted it to come out around Halloween I'm a few days late my apologies but I was first thinking well maybe I can look into historical ghost stories or maybe specifically Tudor ghost stories And then I ran into the ghost of Catherine Howard, that story. It's probably the most famous ghost of the Tudor period is the ghost of Catherine Howard. Um, But I feel like everybody kind of already knows those stories. I couldn't come across anything that I was like, well, this, I'm going to be able to like take a a fresh take on that. Then after reading about Catherine Howard's ghost and thinking about the just absolute horror that she must have experienced, I started thinking about how did she get in this position? Oh yeah, her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, put her in that position. After he had already put two of his other nieces in that position because Tudor Court was a dangerous fucking place and his nieces were disposable to him. And so then I was like, you know what we haven't done in a while? We haven't done a this fucking guy. So today we're going to talk about Thomas Howard, third Duke of Norfolk, this fucking guy. First thing I don't really understand about this fucking guy is that his portrait that I believe is Hans Holbein. He's holding like a two pool sticks. What are, what are you doing, dude? What What is that? Secondly, if you're brand new to the podcast, back when I was in um, deep quarantine, brink of depression, I thought I wanted to be do YouTube videos and I made two this fucking guy videos just talking about asshole men from history, then this fucking guy has been relegated to Patreon. Anyway, so yeah, if you happen to not be familiar, Thomas Howard, he's the uncle of both Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. You know, the two wives that both happened to get their heads cut off by Henry VIII. And as far as I can tell, he treated people like they were absolutely disposable And I'm not a fan. I do want to start with that one of the juicier articles I read to research this fucking guy's fuckery didn't link to any sources. And my good friend, good friend of the show, Christine Morgan, did send me some really interesting documentation that she found when she was doing her thesis. But I don't have any links to give you solid information. 
So do with that with do with that what you will. So Thomas was born during the Wars of the Roses, and his family were like ride or die Richard the Third supporters, which you know hindsight was a mistake. They his father and his grandfather both fought in the Battle of Bosworth, which was the one where Richard the Third was the last king of England to die in battle. Um, yeah, his dad and his grandfather both fought in that war uh, or that battle, and his grandfather actually died at Bosworth along with Richard the Third. And unfortunately for their family, this was not, you know, if they could have seen into the future, they would have picked a different side. So his dad actually loses his title temporarily as Duke of Norfolk when Henry VII becomes king and, like, kicks a bunch of Richard supporters to the curb. When he was young, he was betrothed to Anne of York. That's Elizabeth of York's sister. So she was a princess. Um, I guess he got on Henry VII's good side pretty quickly because he allowed that engagement to go through. So I'm just imagining him. He's kind of giving me... Littlefinger vibes from Game of Thrones. And if you don't watch Game of Thrones, it's just a guy that kind of, mm, kind of swarmy. I don't know, but like is able to win over people somehow. Because Henry VII, yeah, allowed him to marry the sister of his wife, you know, a princess from the York family, which Henry VII didn't do that lightly. You know, I really can't find anything if the marriage to Anne of York was happy or not, but they do have two kids that both died young and then Anne died in her 30s. And up to this point, honestly, I don't have any information for his fuckery. So I don't know if it's like after his wife died that he became this fucking guy. Like, is that some kind of like villain origin story? Or did he just lay low and do some stuff that wasn't getting documented? I don't know. Hold on to your butts, ladies and gentlemen. You're about to not like this man very much. Because this fucking husband to his second wife. Whew. Um, so about two years after Elizabeth of York died, um, I guess Howard's looking around just being like, well, I, I don't have any heirs. I need a wife. And he turns to the Stafford family. Uh, the Duke of Buckingham had a daughter named Elizabeth Stafford. She was 15. Tommy H. was 40. 35, 40, something like that. Still, um, yuck. But that's not the only reason Elizabeth didn't want to marry him. Elizabeth was unofficially betrothed to someone else. Uh, and she was in love with someone else. This guy named Ralph Neville. He was the, like, his the family ward. And the two of them had been kind of courting for two years. So they were like childhood sweethearts. And her father had already told her, like, yeah, once he comes into his majority, you can marry him. But nothing was put in writing. Then Thomas Howard rocks up. He's not yet the Duke. He's just an Earl at this point. But he's his family is more illustrious. He's going to have more money than Ralph Neville. He is going to be a Duke one day. And while Ralph Neville would go on to be an Earl, he just couldn't compete with, yeah, but this guy's the Duke of Norfolk soon, you know. But what's fucked up? is it seems like Elizabeth fa Elizabeth's father actually tried to be like, hey, I do want to make this alliance, but I also don't want to make my daughter miserable. Like, her happiness does matter to me, like, a bit. I've got two other daughters. Why don't you marry one of them? And apparently Thomas Howard was just like, nope, it's Elizabeth or bust. Now, I'm always hesitant to be like, okay, he was just doing this to be a dick. But, like, I'm... I'm trying to work out the reasoning behind this, and I'm struggling, besides to, you know, start off your marriage on the very wrong foot. I don't think it's possible that he, on, he like, was in love with Elizabeth, so that's why he was insisting on her. And 
I was like, well, maybe he wanted to marry her because she's the oldest daughter and therefore she's like the heiress. But they did have a son. And the way that it worked back then is it kind of didn't matter who was the oldest daughter. Once there was a son, he was the heir, period, statement, declarative sentence, end of discussion, you know? So uh, the only thing I can think of maybe, because I couldn't work out the ages of her sisters, maybe, maybe, maybe her sisters were super young and he was like, no, I don't want to wait, you know, five years to marry one of them or something. I I don't know. Either way, it's not a great start to a marriage, you know, be knowing that your wife-to-be absolutely does not want to marry you and love somebody else. But poor Lady Elizabeth had to marry this old man in 1513. And then her little sister married Ralph Neville. So... I don't know, awkward family dinners, I guess. Eh. Anyway, at this time, Elizabeth was already a lady in waiting to Catherine of Aragon. And she and Catherine of Aragon had a very, very close relationship. So to the outside world, though, Henry Catherine, Elizabeth, and Thomas Howard, they're looking like this, you know, set of power couple, best friend, situation. But from the inside, it doesn't appear like this relationship was ever, ever happy. For instance, he told Elizabeth's dad that he'd given her, give her an allowance of 500 marks each year. I don't know how much 500 marks is in current money, but I have to imagine it's substantial if her dad was the fucking Duke of Buckingham and he's making monetary promises for his oldest daughter. But that never happened. She was never given her own money, and we know it's not cheap to live at court. Yeah, you're getting a little bit of income for for being one of the ladies-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon, but I don't know. Does that money go to your husband? Probably. Uh, Being a woman in history is the worst. So anyway, Thomas Howard was appointed as the Lord High Treasurer in 1522, which is like a big fucking deal. It's like one of the highest ranks he could ever aspire to. And I'm not sure if this is a coincidence or not, but this is around the same time that Henry VIII started having his affair with Mary Boleyn, which is, you know, Howard's niece through his sister, Elizabeth Howard, now Elizabeth Boleyn. And so I don't know which came first, the affair or the promotion, but they definitely had some synergy going on there. There was definitely some interesting timing. It's very likely that he just knew Henry's type. And it seems to me like Henry had a very specific type. And he put Mary in the king's line of sight on purpose. And I mean... It wouldn't be the last time he did this, but it was the first time. At least of his nieces. I don't know. There may have been other women that he was friends with at court and did the same thing, but of his family. So, you know, fuck the king to help my career until he discards you. I'm doing some big thumbs up right now. Super cool. Super cool. So this fucking uncle, this fucking husband. So, um, him... Basically handing the king a mistress that he knew he would like on a silver platter didn't help his relationship with his wife. Like I said, she is BFFs with the queen. And I don't think Thomas really cared that it made his wife really, really upset. Somehow the two did go on to have five kids together. And like I said, the public thought that they were like a successful, happy marriage because Elizabeth did What so many women, really people, throughout history have done. They put on a happy face when they're in public and then, you know, go home and cry, probably. But everything fell to pieces in 1527. Howard started seeing a mistress. So Tommy got a mistress. Um, I mean, the king's doing it. I'll do it. I'm super powerful. Who's going to say what to me? You know, did most men 
step out on their marriages in court, like especially in the nobility back then when they could afford to shower this other woman with gifts and stuff like that. Yes, it happened all the time. What is different about this is that he moved his mistress into his family home. Like where, yes, his life, his wife primarily lived at court, but like when she came home, there was his mistress living there. Oh my God. This was a level of disrespect that most women, except for Catherine of Aragon, didn't have to deal with. Like you brought her into this house. What the fuck? Ugh, this fucking husband. It may not come as a surprise to you that uh, his wife was not thrilled with this arrangement. Um, In later years, she wrote letters to Thomas Cromwell. She wrote so many letters to Thomas Cromwell. And, but in those, she claimed that her husband beat her, allowed his staff to beat her, would like hold her down and like prick her with needles and stuff until she drew blood. Like, I, uh, and I don't know if she's like over exaggerating, but even if she was, um, you know, even the played down version of that sounds like a fucking living hell. This was also when things were really brewing at court. Catherine of Aragon versus Anne Boleyn. In one corner, we got the queen. In one corner, we got the, you know, kind of other queen. And Elizabeth was obviously team Catherine of Aragon, while Thomas Howard was team Anne. Also, let's take a minute to unpack how clearly he just saw this beautiful niece as a bargaining chip. Some people would be like, ooh, you had an affair with one of the sisters of your future wife? Like that, like you went from sister to sister? That is some redneck shit is what they call that where I'm from. But I guess Thomas Howard was just like, no, that's some advantageous shit. That's what we call that where I come from. Different strokes, different folks. I don't know. Anne and Thomas Howard eventually had Elizabeth kicked out of court. Like, get the fuck out of here. And like, he did not even pretend to be supporting his wife. He, I kind of felt, feel like he was like, well, if the king can do it, I can do it too. Like, be a complete dick to my wife and act like I don't know her. And to add insult to injury, she was sent to be locked up in a ye old dusty castle for the rest of her life. Ugh! This fucking guy, I am not a Fan. Not only was he a dick to his husband, but let's talk about his nieces. Let's talk about this fucking uncle. So we know what happened to Anne Boleyn. Her uncle, who got her into this whole mess to begin with, sat on a jury that convicted her of treason and conspiracy and just a whole bunch of other shit. But it wasn't just her. It also convicted her brother of incest and treason and all this kind of other shit. They say that he, you know, condemned them to death with a tear in his eye, but I call bullshit. Like, I don't know. Maybe he was pulling a Joey from Friends where he's got, like, a tweezer in his pocket, you know, and is, like, pinching his balls to make him cry. I think that was from Friends. It was from some show from the 90s. But no, I don't think he lost sleep over this. I think the only time he lost sleep over the entire trial was maybe the first couple of days of anxiety of like, is this going to come back to me? Am I going to get in trouble? No, I'm going to be on the jury. Okay, guilty. A guilty as charged. He was willing to turn on anyone so long as it kept him on the up and up at court is what I'm getting at. Sorry, guys, it is Wine Wednesday, and I have now had my first glass. I'm moving on to my second one, and I'm getting worked up. So if I start getting a little bit animated, blame it on the uh, Liberty Creek wine, you know, the fanciest brand from the Walgreens down the street. So then 
Obviously, after he has one niece executed, he has one niece put aside, one niece executed, one nephew executed. Obviously, after that, he quits throwing his family in front of the king, right? (laughs) No. You know what this fucking guy does? He does the exact same thing with Catherine Howard. But with this one, he didn't even do his due diligence. Like, he kind of knew that Anne was smart and that Anne was almost certainly, you know, could pass a background check. He didn't do that shit with Catherine Howard. Put him in front of the king, knew his type. The king was like, yes, do want to bone. Then, as soon as the tides turned against the new queen... uh, (sighs) Tommy over here does what he did last time. Though, I think Anne was probably more aware of the dangers of this whole game of queen, you know? Um, I don't think Catherine Howard was anywhere near as um, prepared to be the queen. And also, I do think things had gotten more dangerous by the time Catherine Howard ascended so really she had no fucking chance did she Mm. someone else he was happy to turn on was thomas cromwell um i don't really have a this fucking whatever for this section um yes i yes i do yes i do this fucking snob um he hated thomas cromwell um because he was like i am the son of a duke my dad was the son of a duke. And we are descendant from kings. And you want me to sit at a table and discuss policies with this peasant. His father and his father's father were poor people. And I really haven't researched Thomas Cromwell all that much. I think they would have be like more like what we compare, like call middle class these days. No, he was not blue blood. And so uh, this fucking guy is immediately like, how dare he? How dare he want to sit at the same table with me? Though I was happy to work alongside him when they were both working to get Anne Boleyn queen. And then he was happy to work as- alongside him when they were working to get Anne Boleyn unqueened or executed or unalived, you know. The moment the tides began to change against Cromwell, he shows his disdain for him so quickly. There is like this scene of... Thomas Cromwell and um, Thomas Howard, all the Tommies, at dinner with some other, you know, movers and shakers, and the two of them have just fucking had it with each other. And they just start a shouting match as soon as Thomas Howard could. He saw the Cleve situation falling apart. Hopefully by this time you've had a chance to listen to our second Anne of Cleves episode, and you know that Henry divorcing Anne was about so much more than her just being quote unquote fat and ugly. It was more about, there was just so many moving pieces. But as soon as Thomas Howard saw this was falling apart, he was just like, yeah, let's kill this fucking peasant. Am I right, guys? (laughs) Am I right? So now let's move on to this fucking war dick. Or we could even say this fucking hypocrite. There was this situation called the Pilgrimage of Grace. I'm not going to go into it because it could be its entire episode. In fact, I think Nathan and I may have covered this in our back catalog here on Patreon. If you're new to Patreon, check out our back catalog. We've got so much, so much content for you. But anyway, uh, the, the TLDR, the Too Long Didn't Read, is that a bunch of people in the north of England were really pissed off about the monasteries being shut down. And it was a bit of a peasant's revolt. Though it wasn't all peasants, there were some people that were in the nobility that were also quietly revolting as well. And Thomas himself was a lifelong Catholic. And even though he personally hated Cromwell for being a non-Catholic loving peasant... He was a major player in brutally killing tons of northern peasants. 
I mean, I guess it comes down to like military stuff. You have to do what the king says unless you want to also get your head chopped off. But like, it seems like he was purposely deceptive. He told them, hey, you know, if you guys just chill the fuck out, quit revolting. You're going to get to come, like, have your day at Parliament. None of you will be charged. And that's just not how it went down. And historically, it has not been a good look for Tommy. So, this fucking war dick. As the king got older, the Seymour family became a lot more important to him. And the Seymour family was growing more and more Protestant. So... They didn't like Thomas Howard all that much. Kind of think about it as like the new guard and the old guard, you know? And they would kind of put Henry's, like they'd put it in Henry's mind that, hey, maybe this guy is a little shifty, which, you know what? Maybe he was. And you know what? We don't trust him. And Henry is in a place in his life where he is growing more and more paranoid and more and more easily persuaded, which we've talked about in this show before. Thomas could tell that this was happening. So he tried to marry one of his daughters to one of the Seymour sons. Because as we already know, uh, I guess we can also say, you know what? This fucking father. The women in his life are nothing but bargaining chips. His daughter didn't want to marry the Seymour guy. Uh, That didn't matter. But luckily for his daughter... Uh, the Seymour guy didn't want to marry him, didn't want to marry her either, so nobody had to go through with it. In December 1546, the tables have turned, and Thomas Howard and his son were arrested and sent to the Tower of London. How does that taste there? How does that taste, Mr. Tommy there? And by that, I mean your own medicine. Um, This is an example of how touchy and chop block happy Henry VIII had gotten in his older years because people really seemed to be arrested for like the slightest thing. You know what I mean? So Thomas's son, Henry, shared the snobby views of his father. Um, You know, our family is better than everybody. We are descended from kings. We are so blue blood. Um, My, I'm descended from this duke and this duke and da 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 da. Everyone else is garbage. And he also felt that about the Seymour family. Not smart. He said the in his head part out loud, you know? So basically what they were arrested for, you and I are probably going to look at and be like, what, what, why is this a thing? But uh, Henry adopted a coat of arms that was the same coat of arms from King Edward III, who he was an ancestor of. And technically that was allowed because he was a direct descendant in like a certain amount of a degree of it. And it was allowed. Also, he tried to get his sister to seduce the king. The sister basically was like, ew, gross. And supposedly said, I'd rather slit my own throat. So go, sister. So the Seymours told Henry VIII, look, that Howard guy, he's using a royal coat of arms. What he's trying to do, he's trying to make sure that as soon as you are gone, he can overthrow your son who's already vulnerable because he is a child and he can take the throne for himself we need to lock him up and his father too because they are fucking dangerous so the howard guys are put on trial for conspiracy i guess i mean as far as i can tell the younger howard actually had the right to use this coat of arms but Henry just didn't like it. Oh, remember uh, Thomas Howard's wife who'd been locked up for all these years? She got to come out of Yield Dusty Castle and she got to give testimony against her asshole husband. She's like, fuck that dude. Yeah, he'll do whatever to get ahead. Chop his fucking head off. His daughter and his mistress also spoke against him. Oh, Tommy, 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 look at this predicament you have gotten yourself into. And in January, both ha- both the Howard boys were sentenced to death by beheading. And 
Norfolk, the older Howard, he basically begged for his life. Unsurprisingly, this fucking father threw his son under the bus. He was like, have his titles, have his money, have my titles, have my money. I didn't do it. It was my son. Look at him. Look at this garbage person. I, you know, no, kill him. Not me, not me, not me, not me. Never me. Ugh, this fucking guy. So his son, Henry Howard, was beheaded on January 19th. And Thomas Howard was scheduled to be beheaded on January 30th. I don't know why they were given different dates, but they were. And Henry VIII died on January 28th, two days before Thomas Howard was meant to be beheaded. So this fucking lucky motherfucker is what I'm going to say with that. Because his beheading got postponed. For whatever reasons, the Seymours, who were now effectively running the country, decided not to execute him. I read they just decided, hey, let's let's not start this reign out with bloodshed or something like that. So he sat in the tower, like just chilling for the entirety of Edward's reign, which was six years and when Mary the first became queen, she took pity on Howard because he was Catholic. And she just wanted all she just wanted all the Catholics, I guess. Because I don't know, if I was her, I might be like, it seems like you are kind of the root of cause of my mother getting, you know, tossed out on her ass. But no, nope, no, nope. Mary decided to take him in. And put him on her council where he served more or less faithfully. I mean, there was, he had no other chips to play. I do think being um, put on death's row, put, uh, you know, killed his spirit, killed his conniving spirit a little bit, if you will. Thomas died at the ripe old age of 80, which back then, damn. I, I do have to wonder at the end of his life. Did he think back on his two nieces that went before him? Did he think about his nephew, his son that died before him? All beheadings that, I don't know, maybe if he would have put his neck out, maybe he could have thwarted. I don't know. He didn't try. He always looked out for himself. But I also wonder, did he sit at the end of his life and think about his wife, his daughter, and his supposedly beloved mistress that all did exactly what he did as soon as they had the chance and throw him under the fucking bus the moment they could and spoke against him at his trial. I don't know. I don't know. He doesn't, there's no diary. Dear diary, I'm about to die and everybody hates me. There's, it doesn't exist. So we just have to leave it to speculation. After his death, we get one more glimpse into this fucking guy. And that is that he left his wife nothing. She is not even mentioned in his will. The mother of his children. Nothing. What do you guys think? Thomas Howard absolute garbage person, as I probably have made clear of my opinion? Or do you think just smart guy that did what he had to do to survive? Let me know. All right. Cheers, bitches. Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. If you want to hear something, just email us at queenshistorypodcast at gmail.com. And follow us on social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have a really great Facebook discussion group. We'd love to see you over there too. And if you're so inclined, we do have a Patreon account if you need more Queen's content in your life. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for listening. Bitches. Cheers, bitches. <laughs> <laughs>